as we are then exhorted, exhorted by true history. <laughs> okay, we're going to read today the October 31st of 1517 when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to All Saints Church in Wittenberg and began his confrontation with the papacy. You see, I believe God is starting another confrontation with the papacy. He's using various men at this time to begin to confront the Pope of Rome with his damnable unbiblical doctrines, calling for debate. Anybody who wants to debate them, come on, let's deal with it from Scripture. It's happening again. Maybe the Lord will send another reformation. Maybe another reformation will take place in the earth, and maybe it will be here in America. Would to God it would be. But it first starts out with men of God confronting evil, wicked sinners working for the papacy as to the doctrine of the Pope of Rome and how it is completely unbiblical. We don't hate Roman Catholic people. Germany was full of Catholics. Germany's, uh, Luther's neighbors were Catholics. He was going after the papacy that was afflicting and persecuting and torturing Catholics. Arresting them, throwing them into the inquisitional dungeons, three feet at three stories underground where their cries couldn't be heard. So God, in raising up this Saxon, puts forth his 95 theses, and here are some of the, here's the introduction and some of the foremost that we will review. Luther writes, Out of love for the truth and the desire to bring it to light, the following propositions will be discussed at Wittenberg under the presidency of the Reverend Father Martin Luther, see, he's still a priest at this time, Master of Arts and of Sacred Theology, the lecturer in ordinary, on the same at that place. Wherefore, he requests that those who are unable to be present and debate orally with us may do so by letter. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. So that's how he starts it out. <laughs> he calls for open debate. And if you don't want to debate me, then do it by letter. So he's set for the defense of the faith. He's holding fast the faithful word. He's contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Jude. We select, the, and we will now select the following of comprehensive, as comprehensive of the spirit and scope of the whole. Number one, our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. Don't you love when Luther calls the Lord his Master? His master, it reminds me of my dear black brother in Christ, Steve Palmer, that I met when I was stationed in Germany. That's how we used to pray. Lord, our master, it is a privilege to call upon thy holy and righteous name. And he was so serious when he sought the Lord, he used to sweat. I'll never forget him. He was, he, he was meant to be a slave from this black man of God. I will never forget. May the Lord bless him wherever he is. Number two, this word cannot be understood to mean sacramental penance, i.e. confession and satisfaction, which is administered by the priests. <laughs> so we're going there. Yet it means not inward repentance only. Nay, there is no inward repentance which does not outwardly work diverse mortifications of the flesh. In other words, if someone is truly born again and you have inward repentance, your works are going to change. You see, Luther's here is really contending for what James says. Faith without works is dead. If you priests came to claim to know Jesus Christ, you can't be a sot. You can't be a drunk. You can't be a fornicator. You can't go into the little nunneries and take your pick of which nuns you want to copulate with, impregnate, and then kill their little babies and throw them in the lime pits. You can't do that anymore if you claim to know Christ. You priests. Number four, the penalty of sin, therefore, continues so long as hatred of self continues. For this is the true inward repentance and continues until our entrance into the kingdom of heaven. That's right. We hate our sinful selves now that we're saved. No good thing dwelleth in my flesh, said the apostle Paul. We love the thought of being delivered from our evil, wicked, sinful nature. And that day will happen when we get a body just like the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Five, the Pope is unable and desires not to remit any other penalty than that which he has imposed of his own good pleasure or comfortably to the canons 
that is to the papal ordinances. So he's unable to remit any penalties or sins. This was, this was a, an explosion when he wrote that. How dare this priest say that the Pope can't remit sins or, or have you light a candle and say a few Hail Marys and get you out of purgatory. Who is this man who says this? Luther says he's nobody. Six, the Pope cannot remit, remit any condemnation but can only declare and confirm the remission that God himself has given except only in cases that belong to him. If he does otherwise, the condemnation continues the same. The Pope has no power to remit, to send away any righteous condemnation of God. And the Bible says in John 3.18, 3, And this is the condemnation, that you've not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. All men are condemned. All men are going to hell. All men are lost in sin. And the only way out is the door. The Lord Jesus Christ, the way of the book of Acts. There's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. And he has not given his glory to another, namely the Pope. He alone is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He alone is the one who's made ample sacrifice. He alone is the one who shed his blood to make remission for our sins. Therefore, there is one mediator, one mediator alone between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5 so Luther's right on here. Eight, the laws of ecclesiastical penance can be imposed only on the living and in no wise respect the dead. Another? Twenty-one, the com commissaries of indulgences are in error when they say that by the papal indulgence a man is delivered from every punishment and is saved. <laughs> you know what this did? This attacked the commerce of the Pope. This attacked his purse. This attacked his huge, fabulous wealth all throughout Europe. Because you see the poor people and their poor little children, many of them not having any shoes to wear. Just like in Mexico today, when those little children go to the priest's chapel there and the, and the cathedrals and they give their little pennies. They give all that they have while they're starving and have no shoes and have rags on. So under the guise that they will have deliverance from hell or deliverance from purgatory. That's why every Roman Catholic country is poor. Because they're all paying Peter's pence. And they're all bringing money to the priests. So those wicked sinners can live wicked lives while lying to you and telling you that if you do this, you're going to have free pardon of sin. Luther smacks in the face the Pope's commerce. And that's the reason, the one of the foremost reasons why the Pope went after him. You get in the way of his business, you're interrupting his crapshoot, and you're going to be in deep trouble. Number 25, the same Pope, that the same power that the Pope has over purgatory in the church at large is possessed by every bishop and every curate in his own particular diocese and parish. 32, those who fancy themselves sure of salvation by indulgences will go to perdition along with those who teach them. Look at that. If you use indulgences for salvation, you're going to go to perdition right along with those priests who teach it. <laughs> can, you, I mean, can you imagine the absolute upheaval that was going on in Wittenberg? Don't you know the people were saying, look at this, look what he wrote. We don't need the priests anymore. We don't need to confess to them anymore. We don't need to give our money to them anymore. Amen! I want to hear more of this Martin Luther. And that was the setting out of which the Reformation was born. And these people were ready, ready, ready. Verse 37, Every true Christian, dead or living, is a partaker of all the blessings of Christ and of the church by the gift of God without any letter of indulgence. So Luther's speaking scripturally here. 38, Yet we must not despise the Pope's distributive and pardoning power for his pardon is a declaration of God's pardon. Okay, this is, this is nonsense while he was yet still a priest. 49. We should teach Christians that the Pope's indulgence is good if we put no confidence in it, but that nothing is more hurtful if it diminishes our piety. 
Again, Luther is attacking the Pope's power of, to grant indulgences. Remember, he went into war with Tetzel, who Tetzel selling indulgences to the people. And if you buy these indulgences, you can go ahead and fornicate with your neighbor's wife. Or you can go ahead and steal from your boss. Or you can go ahead and, uh, and murder your, uh, this guy that uh, said something nasty about your son or something. I mean, all of these indulgences are permissions or licenses to sin. Just like the Federal Reserve Note. Your Federal Reserve Notes are licenses to sin. Your Federal Reserve Notes, our Federal Reserve Notes that we use unwillingly because that's all the devil in control of Washington is allowing us to use these days, are nothing more than Roman papal indulgences. Indulgences were paper money. Give this to the priest and you can go ahead and sin. Give the Federal Reserve note to the man who provides labor for you and you can steal from him because after all, you're not paying him. A Federal Reserve note, not redeemable in gold and silver, has never paid one single debt. It only, quote unquote, discharges debt. Isn't that nice? Isn't that wonderful what the Jesuit lawyers have taught us? Doesn't, doesn't pay a debt, it discharges it. That means you still have it. So therefore, we use these Federal Reserve notes as indulgences. We're a nation of thieves. Where does this concept come from of worthless paper money resting in faith? It comes from indulgences that Luther absolutely repudiated. Number 52. To hope to be saved by indulgences is a lying and an empty hope. Although even the commissary of indulgences, nay further, the Pope himself, should pledge their souls to guarantee it. Even though, the pledge should, even though the Pope should pledge the goodness of the indulgence, it's worthless. Just like your Federal Reserve note. With Eric John Phelps, Biblical Truth and History and Prophecy, we shall return.